She said, I don't know where to start with you, Dara. But you know what? I will start with you. What's, what's your opinion on the state of the game at the moment? Are you loving where it's at? I mean, I know you were involved with yeah. Gaeltic there for a few years and you got all the way to an All-Ireland semi-final. But what's, what's your thoughts on the game at the moment? It's, it's in a strange place. I, I used to think the game was at a crossroads, but I've come around to thinking in the last year or two that it's on this highway that you just can't get off and that there is no going back. I, I did a documentary with Pat Comer there that was aired in RT last year, for example, and we were looking at... No existential stuff within the GA. Where, where is it? Who you know? It was ostensibly about money, but it was really where's the soul of the game right now? And the realization it took a year to do it, and halfway through the year, myself and Pat were having a conversation saying the game isn't at the crossroads. It's going to continue. The games will always be there. They were always there for 130 something years, but it's just the pace of development and change is faster than it was. And it's not, a cross, it's not a case of turning left or right anymore at the crossroads. It's a case of staying on the highway and knowing when to slow down on the highway and to get off the highway if needs be. And that's where I feel about the game at the moment. I just think it's, it's at a very delicate place at the moment in terms of you know, the professionalisation versus the amateur and, in brackets, voluntary sector at the moment. I think, that, you know, and Dublin is a great laboratory for it uh, to see what's going on, the amount of voluntary work that's going on in Dublin, and then, on the other hand, the amount of professionalism that they bring to the game in terms of their preparation, in terms of their resources. That's It's undeniable. And it's not, their, it's not a, anybody's fault or a problem for anybody. It is what it is. And at the moment, in the, the game of Gaelic football, which I'd be interested in, is... I love you know you look at the, the top two teams in the country for the last two or three years has been carrying Dublin, Dublin Mayo, Dublin somebody else, Dublin Tyrone, Dublin. They're brilliant games, they're brilliant entertainment, and you can crib about that. But then, what they are bringing to it is demanding more of the bottom rung of the ladder all the time. I, I was even at a, a county board meeting in, in Kerry in the last week, where they summoned in and they just asked people to come in, secretaries, chairmen, PROs. And it's just what they expect of you as PRO now, what they expect of you as chairman now, it's different. Mm. And that's good. Improvements are good. And we're constantly striving to improve. But just the demands being made and the goodwill that was always there in the GA is a, is a tipping point now, I do think. Mm. So I'm getting the sense that you're not happy with where it's going, that it's moving away from the old ethos that was there? I, I think we loved amateurism. I, I, I think we loved haphazard, ad hoc stuff. And then there's part of you that says, look, we want to tighten up a bit here and uh, perfect this. I, I think the, the ex-athlete in me will always look for something that will kind of try and improve the game and make it better. I love the fact that the Kerry team in 2020 are training a lot smarter than I did maybe 20 years ago and 25 years ago. And, you know, Eamon Fitzmaurice said to me a number of years ago when he was involved with Kerry in the early years, he said, you'd love this training now. You'd really like it because it would be tailored towards the fact that you're, which I'm not, athletic. I never was. And there was a bunch of us in that team, but we were trained as athletes. And that was no fault of anybody's. It was the training at the time. It was the... It was the, the mood at the time, and this is what you had to do. When I started off playing senior football with Kerry, Derry were the All-Ireland champions in 1993. And you're hearing these stories about the Derry lads training in Jordanstown and Queens and doing this. So you do that. At the moment, it's Dublin. And so you're trying to find out every little nugget of information of what do Dublin do differently that makes them the team that they are. And I'm sure there's young lads 20 years of age or 18 years of age, as I was in 1993, trying to find out what they're doing so that they'll emulate or achieve to the same level that Dublin do. That's just natural. I, I get that. Um, but, I, I, you know, I never wanted to be one of these critics of the modern game because when I started off when I was 18 or 19, there were a lot of very garlanded ex carry footballers telling us where we were going wrong. You know, and that's... I, I promised myself I'd never become one of them. And I have nothing but admiration for the Kerry team that are out there at the moment. And they might fall short of winning an All-Ireland in a given year, but I refuse to criticise them. The only thing you, could, you should criticise when you're finished playing football is a lack of effort and a lack of pride in what you once represented. And I don't see that in the Kerry team, and I don't see that in any county team at the moment. You know, But 
it is at a very strange place at the moment when you contrast that with what's going on at club level, in my own area, rural depopulation and all that. There's a massive, massive debate to be had about that. And even just looking at the goalkeeper that's after leaving for, for the yeah, AFL David as well. Ass, yeah, David yeah. Asiosis this week has signed up. And good luck, I know the lad, you couldn't meet a nice guy, just yeah. just like Mark O'Connor before him. And people in Kerry, in Dingle and in West Kerry, are torn between saying, well done, hope you do well out in Australia, and saying, what an asset you'd be for, for Kerry if you stayed at home. There's part, and it's that conflict that's there. And Mark O'Connor, when he was leaving three or four years ago, you know, having a conversation with him, he said, look, I have to find out what this is like. I have to answer the questions. This is the dream for me. And he's dead right. He's dead right. And you look at him then and you see Brian Fenton running right around the country, being the masterful footballer that he is and saying, we have a lad for you, but he's out in Australia. You know, that, and that's the reality. Like, um, Mark O'Connor would be a huge asset, not just to Kerry, but to Dingle, his club. And, uh, y- you know... Everybody at home in West Kerry wish, wishes him, we're very proud of what he's achieved so far and he's going to achieve more. And you would say, in a practical terms, he'd be mad to come home. But then you see what your Uncle Kenny did and came home and that lure has to be there for them. That has to come from the individual themselves. Like So David Ass this week has chosen you know, to go out to Australia to just a curiosity within him to say, how good can I be as an athlete? He won't find that out playing in Kerry, you know, and that's the reality of it. You mentioned the different training that's going on now, training smarter versus, you know, when you were a young lad, 1993 and all that. Do you know of the things that they're doing at the moment that you think you would have excelled at or would have brought you on even a bit more? I think they're doing less of, you know, of the, the slogging. You know, there's still, they're still an element, and it's a conversation I've had in my own club this week, I still believe even club teams have to suffer collectively at some point in the year so that there's that team bond created. But I do think that there was a lot of unnecessary slog in, in the early stages of my career where maybe the, the science wouldn't have been applied to it as well as it could have been. Now, what, what sort of slogging are we talking about here, up and down that sand dunes? Yeah, you're talking running sand dunes, you're talking you know, six-mile runs through sand, you're talking sand pits being created, specifically sand tracks around club pitches, and you're getting to run around it, and you're knowing deep down that you are fit, but it's not doing you any good. And it's not an excuse. Like, you know, I was never athletic. I never pretended to be athletic. And uh, fortunately or otherwise, the game is all about athleticism now and allied with a lot of skill. Um, But we would have done an awful lot of stuff. You know, I I mean, for for 10, 15 years, I ran up sides of Mount Brandon thinking I was doing great stuff to myself. It was only when Pat Flanagan came along as coach of the Kerry team, he said, look at your composition. You shouldn't be doing these things. But that was nearly 10, 12 years into my inter-county career and you're finding these things out. And there's just more science. There's just more thought put into it nowadays. And science and thought takes time, effort, energy and money. Mm. And that's where the game is at at the moment. That clip of the, you know, the Tyrone, famous Tyrone game that, you you know, they kind of absolutely swarmed around you came up on Twitter the other day. And I noticed you were in it, and you know that yeah. famous passage. You got out of it. That's what yeah. I was going to say. Yeah, I don't the thing that was the, uh, it's the thing that uh, for for years people have been saying that clip, for you and I was the the poster boy for turning losing possession. We you actually held that to it twice. Twice <laughs> with with the help of Darashe, one of those things I remember it very clearly. He took some fella clean out of it as a third man tackle, so that I'd stay inside the white line, and we did turn out. I think we will blame on Braston for not actually <laughs> for not actually getting out of it, but. Uh, I, I don't know who lost position in that thing, but it would have been... And I've seen it replayed on you know different programmes that the Tyrone lads have spoken to the Tyrone lads about it since. It, it would have been a great 1-0 to us had we managed to come out of that rock with possession. But they came with such intent that day. It was it was obviously the start of something. Um, it got labelled otherwise at the time. And, it, you know, now it, it's it's a nothing event. You know, that kind of tackling goes on all the time in the in the, in the modern game. And if, if we're being honest with ourselves, we love that muck, mullocking like, you know. I liked it at the time. I didn't like the fact that we lost the game, but I didn't mind that kind of tackling. It was different. It was something that I hadn't experienced possibly before, let's say the collective six or seven lads tackling you. But if, if, if they got to such a pitch as they did, obviously a fitness to be able to maintain that over the course of the game, fair play to them. I didn't particularly like their style in 03, but they were a super team in 05 and 08 and onwards. like So... Um, it, it's a famous incident that probably gets overpaid in people's minds, but I think it should be noted that we kept possession. <laughs> yeah, that was, I was leading up to complimenting you on it. But do you remember what it felt like? Do you remember like yeah. how rattled you were? I, I thought at the time ah, there has to be a free in here somewhere. Yeah. But looking back in it since, oh. there wasn't. It was discipline tackling, and it was a very good bit of work. 
and as I say, it probably set the tone for that the game. I won't say we were shell shocked, but it was new, and it, that was what August, I suppose, two thousand and three. We were out of the championship at that stage. We went on our own with the girls that winter. It kind of, I suppose, announced themselves that it was a huge favour because all the county lads in Kerry went back with the girls. We had our best ever run, got to an All Ireland club final at the end of that year. But by the end of that year, Jack had replaced Paddy as manager, and Jack sat us down very early in his tenure and said, "Look, this is the new reality." And I think every player, the 30 players to a man, accepted it. We weren't going to be bitching and moaning as maybe other people outside of the, our group were and saying that this was puke football or whatever you wanted to call it. We had to get on with that. And then players, the likes of Paul Galvin, Aidan O'Mahony, who were to the manner born when it came to that kind of football, um, they, they thrived over the next couple of years. Once we got it out of our heads, got over our pity party, because it was a pity party and at the time. And it was. There was. We were inclined to maybe to listen to the voices that were saying, this isn't the way football should be played. Mm. Whether we liked it or not, it was the new reality. And Jack had to tell us that maybe in December, January. If, if you go back 60 years uh, to 1943, weren't Antrim giving out about Kerry to yeah. doing the third man tackle? Yeah. And, and Monaghan in 1930, the same and that way. was Kerry. That was Kerry. And, yeah. and Kerry, if we are aware of our history as, as a footballing county, we're not certainly, you know, we, we shouldn't... The one thing you... I do know about the history of Kerry football is we've always adapted and I think they should be given credit for that. The latest challenge is Dublin and I'd like to think that they'll adapt and and that they'll learn but we weren't behind the curtain when it came to dishing it out either. Historically um, complaints were made about st- styles in 1930 the fantastic Antrim team in the f- early 40s complained about Kerry's tactics, rough house tactics by all accounts and you know I'm sure at some stage like the debate was had like you know is this the, the Kerry way the reality is the question we asked ourselves at the end of all three what is the Kerry way is it an abandonment of principles we all yeah we all like to think that we play entertaining football attacking football and to, to a large extent we, we try to do that but I mean the 2014 final Kerry's last all Ireland win Emma Fitzmaurice was one of the great students of Kerry football history would have said look we didn't come up with this template but they did mimic the template that was there in front of them and won an all Ireland doing so mm. and they adapted and they learned and they won their most recent All Ireland. I, I do want to come on to that uh, how you bounce back with Ngwaeltuk to go as far as you did that season. But I want to ask you about hit and freeze as well. Yeah. Like when you were hitting freeze throughout your career, is it something that you really prided yourself on? How much yeah. how much time did you put into them? At the start I hated it because The pressure of it? Yeah. I just wasn't good enough. And then I was replacing Morris with Sturld who was, to my mind, the greatest footballer of all time, let alone the greatest free-taker of all time. And then, statistics might back that Dean Rock is probably the greatest free-taker of all time. His stats will show that, probably. You know, he's amazing, metronomic. Sean Shea is going to be one of the great free-takers. Um, but at the time, you were replacing Morris with Shirley, who was injured. And there's just that feeling that maybe he's looking... In fairness, Morris never felt made me feel like that. But I, I had been taking freeze. That was 2000. I had been on the Kerry squad for seven years. I took the freeze during the league when Morris mightn't have been available. I took I relished taking the freeze with UL in the four years I was in UL. I loved taking the freeze. But at the inter-county level, in 2000, we actually got a free to draw against Armagh, which I took a... I got a nosebleed, actually. I never got, got a knee into the nose. Then Estuary was late tackled, and I was tackled in the same movement after kick. And I was never as glad, like no more than Peter Canavan came over to Owen Mulligan in 2005, I'll take this. Morris came over to me and said, it was a tap over free, but it was a pressure free. And I was glad Morris was in the position to do it at the time. And after that, then I said, look, this has to stop. You have to stop dreading this life. Yeah. And after that, then for the next couple of years, you trained yourself almost to relish the free taking aspect of it. And that was just sheer plod, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours. I wasn't putting in enough hours. You know, and that was that was the reality of it. One good kick might be followed, or three good kicks might be followed by one bad kick, and I hadn't reached the level of consistency that I would have had in 2001, two, three, and four, and five. I'd like to think. So was that was it basically because Morris was there? Which was the bigger factor? Not enough practice or the spectre of Morris hanging over you? Going into an exam and knowing you had the home, homework done. Yeah. You know, it's like an exam. You know, I had put in a lot of hours in UL the four years I was in UL, and in Mary I afterwards seven years as a student. You're practicing morning, uh, noon, and I literally you're practicing in the morning, and you're definitely getting a kicking session in, in the evening as well, and then you're doing the collective sessions with the lads. But then, f- for about a year around 99, 2000, which is when I was given the duty of taking over the free taking at inter-county level, championship and league, I hadn't been putting enough time into it. 
and it was like going into an exam with knowing on memory that you're good at it but not actually convincing yourself that you're good at it like and that year in 2000 I found challenging I I had some good frees but I t- a year or two later I would have been disgusted with some of the ones I missed mm. in 2000 I was mixing up the names there because yeah. uh, it's so many Fitzmorris and Morris yeah, and yeah. the whole lot um when did, did you have to change your technique or anything like that? Is you know the way people talk about Johnny Wilkinson, etc., yeah. that they really honed their technique, and you can even see it in hurling that lads have their own yeah. techniques. Not not so much technique. I always had just a simple thing, and I, th- I see Brian Sheehan doing it after me. He, get, he was the next in line after the free taking. I just kind of a couple of steps back, hands in the hips. I think the most important thing was the the what what I know, which I didn't know at the time. They call visualization, like you know where you're imagining the ball to be over the bar before it's over the bar. And that's what I was doing. Somebody told me once that, and it was around the time, at the peak of Tiger Woods' power, you know, somebody said to me that when Tiger Woods misses a, a putt, he rewinds it in his head and scores it in his head before he takes the next putt. And that was, that's what I did afterwards. And it worked. It just was a simple little trick that, uh, I think they call it visualisation. Mm. Now, you're just, you, you, you imagine the arc of the kick. There was no change in technique. There was no change in anything else. I kicked the way I always kicked. I didn't like to delay too much or hang around too much around kicks or have any little, you know, routines or anything like that. It was just a couple of steps back, hands on the hip, one look at the post, look at the ball from there on in, and imagine the arc of the kick afterwards. And then it's, it helped the fact that I play my home games with the girls. It's always windy, and mm. so you have you have you have different clubs inside in your bag that if you kick it with this part of the boot or that part of the boot, it this weather condition requires this kind of a kick. And a lot of those early years in particular I would have done a lot of outside of the boot slice kicks and everything. Because it was in it was one of the clubs that you had from the fact that I had played so much in Gallerus, always windy. And um, Killarney was the laboratory conditions then in Croke Park. When they did up the new Croke Park, the change that made to me was unbelievable because the old Croke Park was a lot of these undulations and a lot of these humps and hollows. The new Croke Park there was no excuses, no hiding places. If it was 45 metres, it was 45 metres straight. And it was an honest pitch from 2002 onwards. And that helped me as a free taker as well. Did you love playing at Croke Park? Did you, did, like, do you enjoy being out on that stage? Again, early on, I hated it. And I suppose it's just inexperience. You know, it was just, you mythologise Croke Park so much as a kid. You you said, this is where Matt Connor played. This is where Kerry lost the five in a row. This is this, this, you know. Mm. And the first couple of years, the first couple of experiences I would have had in Crow Park weren't positive because we played in quarter final of the National League against Toronto. I think it was in '95 we lost. We lost it down in '94 in, in Crow Park in the playoff in the National League. But once you, once '97 happened, you get your first All Ireland win. Um, you're you're there then. And it, when it became this new pitch, when they did it up, the difference that made to us even. I remember walking in. The quarter final against Galway in 2002, we actually got a walk around. I don't know they allowed to do that anymore. We were allowed to walk in because it was a new pitch, because we had the previous years had been played minus the Hogan standard, minus the Cusick standard, whatever. But the new pitch, we walked around it, and you just said, "This is amazing," you know. And it, to the, it's the pitch we have to this day. It's amazing. There was issues with the surface, obviously, the first couple of years, but by the time I had finished up, it, it was a it was a place you just wanted to play as often and as early in the year as possible. Do you think when you were a young lad, and obviously you're, you're in there at 18, did the expectation for you to go on and deliver for Kerry at a very young age, did that bother you? Or did you kind of feel like, well, this is kind of probably what I have the skill set to do? It, it, it didn't bother me. What bothered me is that in Dara Shea and myself, we grew up together right up along. We played two years Kerry Minor together. We never we never won a Monster Minor title. Do you know, that bugged the shit out of me for years. Like, you know, Why? because... We got caught for two years with sucker goals by against Cork in '92 and '93, both years two late goals, and you're going off to college then. And these lads, you're playing with lads who have all earned minor medals, and you're saying, "I'm as good as these fellas. Like, how come I don't have one of these? Like, you know?" And that hurt, and it hurt so much that we won two under twenty ones afterwards out of that hurt. The teams that would have lost the 92 and 93 monster campaigns won all Ireland under twenty ones, ninety five, ninety six, and I think. That's where my respect for Sigerson football comes out of. It's huge. It's probably not as well understood nowadays because because the country has got so small, because the roads have got so good. You know more about, and because of communication has got so good, you know more about other counties and other players in other counties. Back then, you barely went outside Kerry to play games. You played your games, you played your Munster finals in Limerick and Cork. 
it's only when you get into third level and you're mixing with lads from Louth and Mead and Dublin and you're getting to experience the diff- their different ways of thinking of football and you're getting to see subtly, I suppose, that you know they actually respect Kerry football as much as you do, you know. And that was a, that was important kind of to us, like you know that. And it was never pressure. It was, I honestly felt like once we put the hours in, as I did in in Limerick, and as all the Kerry lads did at the time, there was an obsession with football in UL from the Kerry lads. There was a cohort of us there: Dermot Murphy, James O'Shea, Morgan Shea, Roy Rahilly, All those lads would have put in huge hours out of the hurt of not being good as minors, not winning anything as minors. And that's where that came from for us. I think we just the, we put huge pressure on ourselves to say we are going to win in All Ireland someday. You know, it's going to happen. But well, you know the way '92, obviously the Clare thing came along, yeah. and Seamus Moynihan, I think he yeah, made his debut yeah, that day, yeah. or that was his first year certainly. Yeah. You had to come in and try and turn that around too. Did yeah. you feel the pressure that you had to turn that around? We played the curtain raiser that day in the minors, yeah. and we drew with Cork that day, and they beat us with the two late goals the following day. And I we. One of the selectors at the time, and it was an awful thing to do in like that, I suppose, he told us, go in there and have a look at the scene. We had to collect our gear bags afterwards. And the desolation in that dressing room, you know, and obviously delirium next door. But it was a landmark day. And, you know, even talking to football heads back west, Kerry Waves, this shouldn't be happening. Clare were a good team at the time, but the thing was, this they shouldn't be beating Kerry. It hasn't happened since. And that, to me, was... You were right in the troughs of it then, because I had been at the 91 game against Down, where Kerry had a kind of a mini-resurgence, and they, might they make an All-Ireland final? They didn't. Down went on to win the All-Ireland. And the hope was there that 92 could happen. And then Clare beat you. And then it followed in my first year inside. Cork beat you, 93, 94, 95 it happens again. And it's constant hurt, hurt, hurt. And in Cork, people get that now, because Kerry have the upper hand on them for the last number of years. But they people with short memories don't remember it was like for you know it's not a pity part we were right in the middle of our so-called famine at the time and it was a horrible time to be playing football for Kerry because there was no social media but the criticism was fairly mm. severe like you know and you had to like that's where Pawdy came into it like that's where Pawdy was like the messiah and he literally was because he never did doubt you know he comes in in 95 and he says this shouldn't be happening Maybe he was condescending towards the other counties, like, but these counties shouldn't be beating us. And this is what I'm going to do. And he had come in on the wave of that 95, 96 on the 21 teams that were winning all Ireland. So the doubt disappeared straight away. And you're looking around yourself at Sigerson level, at colleges level, and saying, the best footballer in UCC is Seamus Minan. The best footballer up in UCD is this fella. The best footballers in UCG are carry people. But, you know, so you're saying, it has to happen for us. Was he as, you know, he was obviously a very good manager, but was he as gas as everyone talks uh, about? Him? Unreal. You know, I, I'd say there's in the day goes by that we don't think about him, the players that played underneath him. Anytime we get together, it's about him, we talk. Um, his tournament is on this weekend, and, you know, the, the impression, I suppose, we, we, I suppose, you know, going through it at the time, we didn't realise it, the crack. We just assumed this was this was going to be the way. I, I, I ten years in a car with him, passenger or driver, one one or the other. Like, and a lot of those are kind of winter nights. You know, just the two of us there talking back and over, the crack and the irreverence and the black black humour. Like, you know, which is why you want most of it could not be published or printed, and it was. But he, he was just constant laughing. You know, the stunts he used to pull, the ridiculous stuff he used to try. And it was just a lightness to it all, like that had you in good humour going into the worst training sessions and in good humour coming out of the worst training sessions. He just had a personality that you couldn't but be affected by, you know. Would he have ever wound you up or pulled a prank on you? Ah, he was always winding you, and he was always, in, in hindsight now, he was always playing you, you know, in terms of, you know, dropping the odd bomb into your into your vicinity and seeing how you'd react. And ah, he's he's pulled so many stunts. He he's, you know, I went on the on a, on a, a last weekend with him, the '96 All Ireland final meet in Mayo. The previous weekend we were after winning the under 21s. So myself and himself and Sean Klusky, Larta Mercer, my hotel here in Dingle, the three of us went around Dublin here, like, and I was only a buy-in, like, and I was treated accordingly, like, but the crack we had that weekend, like, the people we met, and the the pints that were drank and the stunts that were pulled, like, it had set you up for, you know, this what it, this is what it must have been like when Pawdy was playing, and that kind of culture kind of regenerates itself in. So through our team, from the, those years, for those ten or twelve years. We were always, you know, I wonder what would the, the Golden Years team, how they would have been, you know, I don't know whether the best role models to look up to off the field, but they were great footballers and that was enough for us, you know. Because everyone seems to smile from ear to ear when you talk about potty. Uh, you'd have to, you'd have to, like, 
the you know the stuff that he just pulled the you know he was ridiculous like it was ridiculous some of the 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 you know the stunts that he pulled and the, you know the memories that you'd have of him like you know and he was a bloody good manager as well that pr probably gets lost and, you know again at at this remove now he was exactly what Kerry needed when he came along as manager god knows he looked for the job long enough but when they handed him the job and it wasn't the first year wasn't without its trials and tribulations but he was exactly the type of personality and exactly the type of manager that Kerry needed. I'm not so sure he'd be an unbelievable manager in the modern sense, but he was of his time, and that time for him was from, let's say, late 95 to late 2003. He gave eight years of just, yeah, we won two All-Irelands. Yeah, maybe people say we could have won more. We definitely wouldn't have won what we won without him. And do you know what? I don't care what we won. We wouldn't have had the crack that we had if he wasn't there, you know. Do you have a favourite day in a Kerry jersey? I don't know. The, the favourite days in any football jersey are actually the small moments more than anything else. Um, I, I couldn't say my first All-Ireland was a favourite day because I stank the place out. I, was, I had an awful game. Personally, as delighted as I was that we won the release that, was, that came with winning your first All-Ireland. Um, did, did that make you torn at the final whistle, feeling that way? No, 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 you forget it immediately. Jesus, you're after winning your first All-Ireland. I just didn't play well, and I was told so from there till Christmas by Kerry people afterwards. <laughs> and well, do you know, that one of the favourite days would have been in 2002 semi-final, where we beat Cork, and I would consider it to be one of the most perfect footballing performances by any team, not just the Kerry team. Um, Cork were after beating us in, earlier in... in, in, in um, in the Munster semi-final it was, the O'Shea's father had been buried that week and we lost and we were all down and out, we were very dejected, we had let the lads down and we didn't play well and we were just waiting in the long grass, it was the first year that we had to go in the back door, the back door was just, I suppose, invented the year beforehand and God, God loved them, you know, Wicklow's and Fermanagh's and these lads, Kildare under Mikko came in our way and they were just wiped out, Galway were the All-Ireland champions, reigning All-Ireland, we, we beat them handy in, in the quarter-final and it was Cork were before us, and it just you couldn't have scripted it like, and they hadn't a chance, you know. They, you know they were a fantastic Cork team. They were good enough to, you know, go toe to toe with us for years around that time. But the pent up hurt that was there from earlier on in June, they were just. It was the day that Colin Corkery and Shamo had a battle at the edge of the square, and you know from the word go, everything was just perfect. And afterwards, Larry Tompkins, who was you know a childhood hero of ours, like you know came into the dressing room and he was dejected he was white in the face but I think he acknowledged you know that that was some performance that beat us and it's just one of those days when you know you know 10 minutes into the game geez everything is going right for us here and they're the kind of days we didn't win the All-Ireland afterwards our man did but we had a great crack with Paddy out in South Africa at the end of the year and they're the things you remember Do you know, I, all, over the course of 10 or 12 years playing with Kerry all the games merge into one in a way like I don't have that specific memory I do have for underage stuff and for club stuff but for county stuff you're kind of trying to say when you were drinking pints with lads what, what year was that again or what game was that again but you do remember the, how, how Paddy made you feel and the, the holidays you had And but I do remember that day in 02 against Cork where I don't even know what the score was but it was one of those days where you just felt everything we've tried in the training ground is working out here. Like, and that's very satisfying as a, as, a, as a footballer. Like, when you say you remember certain things from underage, is there something that's coming to mind when you're saying that? No, I, I remember nearly every game um, that we would have played. We won Division Four, Three, Two, and we lost Division One by a pint. For example, in 1987, 12 years of age, we were beaten by Lawn Rangers, who were, went on to win an All Ireland club later with a lot of the same lads, Liam Hassett, Mike Hassett, etc. And I remember the score that day, 1-4 to 1-3. I remember who was referee because he pulled... Dahi O'Shea, the famous TV star, was playing with us at the time. And he was a year or two younger than me. And he actually got a point that was called back. And we lost by a point, called back to take a free. The ref gave a free instead of giving Dahi his point. And I don't know if Dahi remembers that, but I, all those little things. I remember a particular way uh, the year beforehand in 1986 where we won the Division 2 final against Spa and was played in Blenneville. And I remember a type of free that a guy called Ono Slattery took and it just lifted straight off his boot. And it was the same day that Maradona got the two goals against Belgium. Do you know the way you remember things as a kid that you don't remember when you're an adult? And all those things. I was a big Liverpool fan and... and 
you remember who Liverpool were playing that day. I remember, you know, when we played the county under 14 final, it was the day after Michael Thomas got the winner for Arsenal and the lad that was standing alongside me, to, uh, Foley from Kilargan. He, he mentioned it and the, we were throwing, throwing in the ball from midfield and I hit him and I was just so angry that Michael Thomas had beaten had Liverpool had lost the, and I just hit him before the, the game even started and they had beaten us two years earlier in that Division 1 final as well they're the things you remember as a kid like you know whereas at senior level because the games are so big and because there's so much preparation gone into it you actually don't remember the, the actual game itself and I regret that do you think it's also true when you're a kid there's very little else that's actually tangibly important in your life oh. because you don't have to look after bills you don't it's just go out and play and then like yeah. sport is actually yeah. fairly important to you oh, f- football is the still point to your turning world like when you're like that you know I mean like the, the Kerry team at the time were gods to us like they were I remember the day Ogie Moran stopped just you know we, we met him he was working in Dingle at the time and we said we were going playing Castle Island Desmond's and he said oh that's Charlie Nelligan's club you know because obviously Charlie's playing with him and I'll never forget it like and it's again it's a mark of the man like to this day but two weeks later he was driving by and we were waiting for another game at a bus stop and he stopped and said did you beat Desmond's he remembered yeah. and we couldn't believe that we just could the impression people like that leave on kids I know I knew I was very aware of that when I was playing with Kerry then afterwards like you know because like them there to us were colossal people like you know mm. we thought when Tim Kennelly came with the cup that he was 6 foot 10 tall like you know Ambrose O'Donovan likewise in 84 just clear vivid memories of these lads like and you know they're the things you remember as kids like you know you, kids need their heroes it's a cliche and we were very fortunate in those years to have them immediately present just like the Dublin kids in schools now when the Sam Maguire comes in like mm. I mean I'm sure kids in Leitrim and in Carlow and teams that aren't as successful have those heroes as well, and they ha- and rightly so. But to us, like you know, to to be seeing the Sam Maguire there right in front of you and to have Ogie Moore and ask you if you bet, if you bet Castle Island Desmonds two weeks previous, that's huge. Like, did you have a favourite player in any sport? Because you mentioned you were a Liverpool fan growing yeah, up. Well, you know, as a kid, Kenny Dalglish and Rush was the thing. Like, yeah. uh, and. More so than football at the time, because football wasn't as well promoted. Gaelic football, like, wasn't as well promoted as soccer was at the time. We didn't have the matches that day. We didn't. We had the one channel before Network Two came on, or whatever it was, RT Two. Um, but yeah, Kenny Dalglish and Rush. You see, there were sticker books, and there was, you know, collectors. You know, rugby was. I had a sticker book on rugby at the time from 1982, 83. Um, but in, in terms of football, it was. You went to the league games, you went to the championship games. We didn't get to go to finals, mm-hmm. you know, because in our house, anyway, it was every. My brother would go one year and the fu- I'd go the next year. So I was at the 81 final at six years of age. We didn't go to 82 for some reason. I suppose we were probably sure of the five in a row. <laughs> yeah. But it, my brother went to 84, I went to 86, and we never went to the year party was captain 85 for some reason. We couldn't go. But you're going to these games and, I mean, the, the, the heroes are obvious, you know. I mean, for me, I like Togi Moore now. I love Mikey Sheehy. You know, it was interesting. And outside the county, then Matt Connor, like, was, you know, some. I just loved his style. And then when I'm 13 years of age, Morris Fitzgerald comes on the scene. And for 10, 15 years afterwards, you're saying, this guy is the greatest thing. And to this day, he's still my favourite footballer, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned, like, all those different guys. And I'm trying to remember, what year was it that um, that Paddy O'Shea burst? Uh, was it Dini Allen with the Dini box? Dini Allen. Th- that, I'd say that was... Were you even, did you see that? I don't remember. I don't have a yeah. childhood memory of it. You know, we've seen it all. In, we've all seen it on YouTube and all that now. Like, and Paddy had that reputation. I mean, one of the ma- big childhood memories I would have had was when Paddy well, had been dropped by Dwyer. And he was on a personal crusade trying to get on back on the Kerry team late, late, late in his career. I think it was actually right at the tail end of his career. And we played an under-16 final as a curtain raiser to a West Kerry League final between Gaeltacht and Lisboa. And I was behind the goal collecting balls. And, or we had left our gear bags inside in the dressing room you know, to be collected afterwards. And I was behind. And 45 yards out, he, this famous collision which made the national headlines at the time. He, he burst uh, Dennis Higgins, uh, you know, he just absolutely bust him, like, you know. Now, my thinking at the time was he prevented a certain goal and won the West Kerry League title for the Gaeltacht. Paddy was actually sent off, he was unconscious on the ground and the referee sent him off. There were no cards in those days, but I have a distinct memory of, of Tommy Shocker, who was an All-Ireland referee at the time, standing over him and sending him, telling him he was being sent off. But I remember the collision and I remember afterwards the two lads being brought in. Now, Dennis Higgins had his two cheekbones fractured, I think. Paddy had 
32 stitches to get into his ear. That's where he collided with him. And being inside in the dressing room collecting our gear bags from the under-16 game and the blood on the floor and the two boys stretched out there. like And the, the tension that was there between the spoil and the girl who would normally be very friendly at the time. You know, they, they're, they're the memories that, that, that form your thinking as a footballer. like. And I think it was after that that Paddy quit playing, actually. I think he, when he quit with Kerry, he, would try, he just said, look, I'm not going to get back with Kerry. The injury was going to take a while to heal. So he actually finished with Kerry and the girl then. I mean, would think it would have been 89, 90. Because I suppose as you get older, you can feel yourself out on the field being making less of an impact. Did you, when you got, I don't know, towards the tail end of your Kerry or club yeah. career, did you feel like oh, I can't do certain things anymore, or do you even know what they were? Towards, towards the end of the Kerry career, it was very straightforward. Um, we were after losing the All Ireland final to Tyrone. I was disgusted with my performance, absolutely disgusted with my second half performance that day, and. Um, I came back training for the 2006 season, angry, you know, and on a total crusade. And, uh, you know, angry with myself, angry with the game, angry with everything, like, you know, back training with a bunch of young lads, Killian Young, Darren Sullivan, these lads were just new on the scene. Mm -hmm. And you're looking around the dressing room, and, you know, I gave a month training, I think, and it just wasn't happening. The, The stuff wasn't coming back into the stomach. And I remember ringing Jack O'Connor and I said, I'm gone. Do you know, and it was the old adage, like, if there is a doubt, there should be no doubt. And that's made the decision right there and then. So I'm gone, I'm out. And I'm getting on with life. I want to go back eating fish and chips, which I couldn't do for 10 years. And the simple stuff, like, you know, because I love my food. And, you know, I was, as I say, I never had the athletic type. I loved f- food, you know, all the stuff that you couldn't have as a footballer, like. And it was killing me. It was eating me up. And... Uh, <laughs> And it was just such a release. So I gave two years of the club then afterwards, like where I put everything into it. And at the end of those two years, again, I'd be, you know, I just couldn't get out of bed without, you know, just doing an hour's exercises. You know, the ba- the discs were gone, the back, everything was wrong. And again, it was a very easy decision. It was, you know, I thought when, you, when you're 16, you think you can play until you're 40, 42, which I would have loved to have done, like Tomás O'Shea played until he was played in all Ireland club final at the age of 40. Nothing but respect and admiration and envy for that. But I was finished at 33. You know, I just, I needed to take a year out and probably do a back operation, which I wasn't willing to do. We had two kids at the time and life just took over. And I often hear people being asked the question, oh, did you find it hard? I thought it was the easiest thing ever to do because... Do you know, you just throw yourself into something else, club administration, coaching, underage, stuff like that. It's it's just a natural part of it. Like, I, I never got this thing where players say, you know, and it, it was a question I was asked, and will you miss it, you know, when you go to the moon? There was nothing. There was no sensation. It was just, you know, gratitude for having the 12 years at inter-county level that I had, the 16 years at club level that I had, and nothing else but, you know, it's like a job. You think when you quit your job or you move to... that. You know, something nothing changes. Life will go on. I remember saying to Jack O'Connor at the time in '06 when I finished, "So Jack, you're going to win the All Ireland this year." I know it. I knew it, and I knew what I was walking away from. It probably, you know, they were the first team to do back to back in a long time. That '06 and '07 team, and I, the stuff was there. There were some brilliant footballers, you know, that you'd be privileged to play with. But it was so easy to walk away from at the same time because I felt my standards weren't as good as they should have been, and I just felt that I wasn't good enough to play with these lads anymore and I didn't want to be leaving myself down. I always wanted to be starting full forward or centre forward and I didn't want to be a sub and I know it's an awful thing. I didn't want to be putting all that effort in for half the reward. And do you know, they, they, you, you, don't, you said there's no regrets. There isn't. You had, it, is, it, it is what it is. It was what it was. And, and in another 10 years' time, I'd say all I remember is the crack. You know, and the fun and the camaraderie and all that. The medals aren't important, like you know. You know, just to jump back then a couple of years to '04. You know, you'd you'd been knocked out by Tyrone, and then you end up on that club run. You get all the way to the All Ireland Club final, and like it's a brilliant thing. I think until someone is is on it, you don't really understand the notion of a club journey. And it is brilliant. I'd say the meetings of Caltra. I'd say you kind of. Every time you see them, there, there was a reconciliation. Do you know what? And it was the best thing that ever happened in terms, of, in philosophical terms, in terms of football. I got a call from Noel Meehan, who was the best player in the field that day for Caltra, and he had his own issues with heart trouble afterwards. Shortly after that, he was going to be on the Galway team, and uh, you know he had to finish playing football because of it. Like, but a couple of years ago, he rang me out of the blue. I know he got my number somewhere, and he said, "Look, we're having, we're opening a new community centre. We have a new pitch in Caltra. We'd love the girls to come up." 
and I, he was kind of tentative about it. And I said, Jesus, it's a great idea. It'll be a bit of a blowout, you know. Mm. And we hadn't broached the cultural issue in, in the club, you know. In your own club? Yeah, we lost in 04. And this might have been, I'd say it was 2015 or 16. I know it was years later anyway. So you're saying none of the players had sat down and yeah. talked? No, no, no. And to this day, we can't process it. Like, you know, we just didn't. I remember having a pint with Declan Meehan in the players' lounge at that very day St. Patrick's Day 2004 and we had been there I'd been there four years previously where we had beaten Galway after a replay in All-Ireland seeing those lads shattered and having a point with Sean Ogde Pair and seeing the devastation and it's hard you're after winning in All-Ireland and you're trying to contain yourself and not to be too smarmy about it like you know and Declan was exactly the same way to me and I recognised the signs so I said Declan you're after winning the All-Ireland like you know fair play to you like you know and he was nearly apologising for winning it like you know and I, I was saying that there was there was such a class act at Caltra team in fairness off the field like you know, but we never we we were never the same as a club afterwards. We, we that was a we'd won what we won and we won the county championship no one we won the county championship no three we went on to a four, we got to the semi final no four all right and Kerry but we were we were on a downhill slide mightn't have realised it at the time but we were and subsequently like our last my last game was 07 we won the county league division one title which was one that we had never won. But for years, I've nobody spoke about culture. Nobody. It's it was a gnawing regret, and about five or six of us, we we, we thought we'd all about thirty of us managed to go up. But by the time the weekend came around, five of us went up, and you know, we had the best co- night. You know, it was just so nice to see that the crowd that beat us were exact same as ourselves. You know. They're probably never going to be back in the All Ireland Club final unless something miraculous happens in Caltra football, and they had the same trajectory as we had as a club, where they'd slip down to intermediate. They had their Michael Meehan's, we had our Mark O'Shea and Tomas O'Shea for years afterwards. But it was the pinnacle of their achievement as a club, like, and to see what that did for them, and you know, they're the things that you can't be taken away. They have it, we don't, and it is a regret. It's the, probably the only regret I have out of the game, and even talking to when Tomas finished up and Mark finished up and Dara finished up. I know anybody finished up, you know, you'd say, you'd expect to say, losing the RL Iron to Armagh or to Toronto. It's Caltra, 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 you know, and it's it's that feeling of. I remember being out in the field that time, and my first cousin, Kahlo Duda, who's an unbelievable man in our club to this day, like, saying, you know, he said to me, looking for kind of a bit of soul loss, you know, Bimmy Tarnash, you know, we, we, we'll be back. And I said, ah, of course we will, yeah, you know, Bimmy Tarnash. But you probably know, even out there in the pitch, we're so small, we're not, we're not. It will take some miracle to get us back. And we never really addressed it. And I didn't anyway until we went up to Caltra that time. And you'd see inside in the community hall, and they're opening their new pitch, and they're opening their new community hall, and we're drinking pints, and they're, uh, Jaff Allen is there, one or two of the Galway lads are there, and you're saying, do you know what? If, if you had to be design a team to be beaten by, it was them. There was no animosity towards them. There was no anything towards them, only just respect. Like, And that's the way the GA should be like, you know. Well, I presume you got very, very close during that period. That's, you, like you're saying, the the O'Shea is there. You're, yeah. you're kind of living in each other's pockets as well. You, would you have been very close with them throughout? I, I would more so when we were younger, because Mark lives in Tralee now, Tomas lives in Cork, and Dara lives in Tralee. Fergal is my kid's school teacher and an absolutely brilliant teacher. And he's the one guy I see every day. I see him at the gate every day. And you know, it's, it's an all ironic thing. Fergal gave us, I suppose, 10 years of his life, a lot of which he was injured himself coaching us when he was 27 8 into his mid 30s like you know and it, it's only now I realise what he did for us like you know and you see him there at the school gate every day and you do think of what we didn't win yeah. Caltra he was our manager that day you know and uh, you know and I, we've, we've never really spoken about it that much like in the club like you know and it's not like there's any it'll change anything but I suppose you know the, the, the bond teams I suppose it's the thing you, I, I'd say to younger players often, you're asked to talk and stuff, and even our own club now, where you're 20 years older than the lads, you're trying to coach inside in the dressing room, and you're trying to say to them, make the most of these years, lads, because you think when you're 20 that you have a million games to play and look the next game, the next game, and you don't actually stop to think, Jesus, this is in part, this is what you remember, because a lot of those players, you know, you, I, I, I have a on a normal working day, I have about a seven or eight mile commute into work, and I see those lads. You know, you'd salute them. You don't stop to talk. Like you, you, some of them are in America. Some of them, but a lot of them are still around. You'd see them coaching kids. You'd see Adon's a school principal over the road. Rob is working. You know, and you don't actually meet half, meet up half as much as you should. 
nobody tells you that when you're playing at 25 years of age these are the best days of your life like you know it's not like it's all downhill you just set different targets for yourself but that you know the the old the age old question when does it that team stop being a team we had a reunion this time last year for winning a novice and a junior title and it was a lovely night but we all that's the last time I had a point with Arashe for example do you know you don't see each other as much it's, I think people need to realise that when you're, and nobody tells you that when you're 20 that you mightn't all be together ever again you know there's lads in Australia the one unfortunately one of the lads has passed away since do you know and p- life happens and life catches up with people and, and, and you nobody tells you that and, and that's why you know I see it in the side in our own clubhouse that pictures are important there are snapshots of that time like, and they are important but the bond that particular team has, the bond the current Kerry team have or the current Kerry Galta team have, that can't be recreated next year or the year after, the year after. It just time catches up with you and you know, you do hear these trite cliches being thrown, win as much as you can for as long but I would say enjoy it as much as you can for as long as you can. You know, winning is nice, but she's look middle you know, it, it it's not so much about the middle to you know, if if we got Alzheimer's, God forbid, or anything like that. What, what's it worth to you then? What are your middles worth to you? You know, it, it's the here and now, and nobody tells that to, to younger players now, I think, you know. I think a lot of people would be like, they don't even know where their medals are. No, and, and it's not an issue. I mean, a good friend of mine called from San Francisco a number of years ago, Joe Duffy from Armagh, with his father, and, you know, he's promoting GA outside there years at Ulster, and he said, he asked me, he was called to the house, and he said, um, I'd love to see you all there in the middle, and I honestly... I was embarrassed. I, said, I don't know where it is, where they are, like, you know. But it's said, the memories of the final whistle, exactly, the ten minutes after. Exactly, and in touch wood, look, I, you'd hear, you hear stories and you see, you know, I was a Graham Garrett, he recently was his house robbed and he, somebody stole his medals or mm. people lose their medals. You say, yeah, it's horrible and it shouldn't be happening and, you know, it's something you might like to give to your kids or whatever, but it's not a physical medal. Yeah. And by the time, if you do lose your memory, what's the point in having medals anyway? It's like taking a photograph. You know, our obsession with taking photographs of social events and Facebook and all this, they're not important, like, because you're taking photographs and you're saying, just be present in the moment, like, you know, and it's the same when you're playing football. The end of every game should be an anticlimax. And it all, to me, it was like, you're, 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 you're living for 70 minutes, 78 minutes, whatever it is, like, and then it's an anticlimax. The celebrations are nice or whatever, and the company afterwards inside the pub, and the 10 minutes afterwards inside the dressing room after winning a big game is huge. But the end of every, the final whistle is an anticlimax. Even when you win in All Ireland, I remember Joe Brawley saying it years ago. He's inside in the shower after winning his one and only All Ireland and his the, you know highlight of his footballing career, and he said to himself, "Is that is that it?" <laughs> and nobody tells you that either, like you know. And it sounds smarmy and condescending to say it when you have those medals, but the reality is like what's important is, you know, how you felt or how you know how you addressed a, a thousand hours of practicing a particular free and nailing it that's the thrill mm. it's not the celebrations it's not the you do you feel happy for your parents because they've watched you being cranky at home and your wife or whatever and, and your community the pride that's there but the game should be everything when you're playing when you're able to play it's and and the final whistle should be an anticlimax after that you know was there a feeling of getting the old band back together when yourself and Mark O'Shea took over uh, on Gaeltic for, was it 17, 18, 19? You got to 17 and 18 and, you know, you could describe it as, a, as an ego trip in a way. Cunlo Crowley and Mark O'Shea were the two joint managers and they were brilliant. And I was asked to come fall in with it as a selector and I collected the balls and the, did the water or whatever. And there was a few more of us involved, like there was five of us all, and the crack we had there together. And I suppose the thought did come into our head, like, you know, we, we won in a Munster club title and you're trying to guide lads who are 20 years younger than you and they're fantastic footballers and they're doing things that we probably never could do and we do things that they couldn't do and you're getting closer to an all Ireland final and Caltra did come into your head you're kind of saying will this be a redemption for Mark in particular because he was still playing it would be lovely if he could win that medal finally you know it was been an intermediate medal but it would have meant a lot it would have meant a lot now we were beaten by Mai we got suckered again in the last minute like with an injury time with a, with a late goal and it wasn't to be and you know we haven't got back to that level since but the hope is still there that the young lad but we can't live and Mark has finished playing now as well you can live your life through the players that are there now I can't transmit to them how important it would be for me for the, to see them winning and to the community to, how important it would be and you can transmit to them how the community felt in 2004 when we went to where we went and to this day there's great memories there like, but 
you have to treat every group of players in their, on their own merits. And their, they mightn't want it as much as you. They mightn't feel the same way you do about the game. Or they might feel even more passionate about it than you did. I don't question that they do. But each team has a lifetime. Each team has its own story to tell. And you find that with a lot of management, you have to stop yourself trying to live your life through your team, trying to transmit your values and your views on the game to them they mightn't necessarily get that you know and that's a mistake I would have made in the past like. I'd say it's a very different world going into a dressing room with like because as an older player and I'd be 20 years older than some of the lads I'm in a dressing room with they'd be having conversations about stuff that I don't I don't even know what you're talking about in the first place yeah, yeah. We could, there was probably a lot of that going on in our own time even like you know because people come from so many different backgrounds as well but yeah, you know, I, I would never presume to know what a, a 20-year-old student has gone through now compared to what I was doing when I was a 20-year-old student. All I know is that, you know, all I was back then was what I was going after, was, you know, a medal, a medal, a medal, a medal. And that's fine too, and I don't regret it, and I wouldn't change it. But you, I have to accept that maybe young lads today are different. Maybe, maybe that's not what they want. Maybe, you know... And you have to break it down and explain it in a different way. And they're about performance and the process. And, mm. you know, and that's fine too. Like, but I do hope, and I, I often would ask young lads, are you enjoying it? Is it, is, is it a crack? You know, I remember having a, a conversation with Jack O'Connor the night that Paddy passed away. It was the same day as David Murphy's wedding, actually. And I was saying to, we were talking about Paddy late in the night, as you do. And you're kind of going like, you know, it's Paddy that a lot of us will remember because the crack we had and you know that and how he made you feel and Jack was a brilliant manager an absolutely um, a process man uh, a structure man uh, an organisation man and good crack as well in his own way but you know for the seven or eight years of pod he was there now would have played under Ogie Moran who was an absolute brilliant manager just wasn't wasn't successful um, Jack O'Connor was Paddy was and you know but it, what you do remember is how they made you feel it's the old cliche like how they made you feel about the game as much as anything else and you know usually I suppose I'm sure if you ask the Dublin players now how Jim Gavin made them feel about the game obviously there's something positive going on they win a five in a row you know I'm sure and I do and I, I do believe that they are enjoying it I'm sure they are but I, I would hate to think that players nowadays are playing and putting so much time into something that they might look back on in 20 years and say geez, that wasn't much crack was it I hope they are having crack like I have to say I miss show sport being on on a Friday night and even the rerun on a Saturday. You must miss it yourself. Like you pre- presented it for how many years? Nine or ten years, I suppose. Yeah, it was it was a good crack. Um, and again, it was an absolute privilege to get to know the likes, you know, Kieran Kilkenny, who was an emerging player at the time, and you know, to meet people from all counties all over the country and to bring them into a studio on a Friday night. And it was almost like having a casual, you know, a casual conversation about the, you know, it's a. It's a whetting of appetites. That's how I always felt. You know, the privilege of looking into your Loch Nan's eyes and seeing the development. <laughs> you know, you're sitting, you know, a yard away from him, and you're you're throwing him a question halfway through the question. You realise this flicker is going to come up with something. You know, here you can see the mischief in his eyes, like you know, and that 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 I do miss. You know, there was a lot of travelling and a lot of work involved, and it was it was, you know, it was nice to get to know a lot of people around the industry at the time. I went and did that GA USA documentary around that time. It was it was a huge privilege to be able to go to America and collect stories of you know the development of the game in America and I got to know different people um, behind the scenes like that as well it was a period of you know the, of, the, of my life professional life that was very very enjoyable and I do miss it and it's you know it's I always kind of get a kick when people still say that they do miss it it was a it was a nice it was a nice program it was a lovely format um, Germany kind of used to go out on the road and get some great interviews you know before we knew Cian Lynch was great cracking bonkers we saw it in show sport when he was a kid like you know and they were getting a lot of that stuff and it was it was a huge a huge asset and it's something I look back on very fondly and I suppose you kind of probably I'm sure you didn't want to let it go I mean I'm sure you pushed hard to keep it on ah uh, yeah I was very reluctant to let it go I was very disappointed when it did finish um, there was there was a, a lot of uh, talk and uh, criticism, implicit and explicit at the time of the decision. But you know, you have to respect this, these decisions. I didn't agree with it. I still don't agree with it. Like, but I mean, that's 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 everybody else's prerogative too. You know, and you know, you can't be for whatever. Way, I don't know. Is it the football training? I mean, 
I, 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 you know, you, once you play a match, you move on to the next match. I never look back at, at things like that. You know, I tend, I don't in life, and certainly in a professional sense, and certainly in that game, you know, which I'm still in, working radio and stuff like that. You never look back. You're kind of almost by default programmed to look forward all the time. Like, but I do look back and it with you know great fondness, and I do regret that it's not there. Because you were being talked up then as the next man for the Sunday game presenter as well. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's something that I that I it never crossed my mind in particular because. You know, there, there was uh, that was all done in house with an RT. I am an RT employee, I suppose, um, and I did five years, I think, as a analyst in the Sunday game as well. And I saw behind the scenes there and the work that went in there and the, the process involved there. I think I was there in six, seven, eight, nine, and ten those years. And you know, um, it was it was enjoyable again to to get to know a lot of the person of some of the fellow pundits that I wouldn't have met. You know, Colin O'Rourke, for example. Um, you know who I would have respected hugely as a footballer who hit me the hardest belt I ever got on the football pitch. It was nice to get to know him behind the scenes as well. You know, and I was up in Avon last year and I had a pint with him during after the Kerry uh, meet game, and that was the one of the big benefits of being involved in the Sunday game. There's a lot, of, a lot of work goes into it, and uh, it, it's a Dublin-based thing. Like, but I did enjoy that aspect of it. I did enjoy presenting the the game, and I had I'd had a natural curiosity about the games. Still, like that, I I like talking about the games. We obsess about the games down and carry hurling and football and it's nice to structure your career around that you know this current Kerry team what do you make of them um, I, I think they're not too far away and obviously results last year will back that up um, I do think we had a m- massive chance in the drawing game last year you know and I don't think they're going to sit on that and harbour any regrets about it you know they'll have to move on they'll have to develop um, it's well known that they're going to have to develop probably d- defensively as much as anything else. I think it's uh, every time I go to see David Clifford and Shawnee Shea play, it's an absolute thrill. They give me the same feelings I got watching Morris Fitzgerald or the Gooch or any of these great forwards like over the years. I mean, David Clifford, uh, you know, watching him in the county championship last year, and it, it's very rare you get that in a game as a spectator, as an ex-player spectator, that you get that buzz. And you get it with Clifford, you get it with Shawnee Shea. I mean, Shawnee Shea's performance in the draw in All Ireland last year, as a free taker, the, the pressure that was on him, I just, I was just in awe of him. Like, you know, I have huge respect for these lads, and I think everything I hear about them, I wouldn't know these lads. You know, I never meet them socially or otherwise. Everything I hear about them, I admire and respect. And you know, I'm a Kerry fan, of course I am, and I want them and will them to do well. And I know the effort that they put in and I know that they're not going to be far off it. they've been hugely successful underage and it does you know it's a big topic of conversation down in Kerry at the moment how are we going to topple Dublin you know to do that you have to get through X amount of games to get at them and you can't fast forward them games but they do need to improve defensively and that's very evident from even from the league games so far this year the gaps that are there need to be plugged and I don't want to be critical of them I'm sure it's not for lack of effort but I, I, I have watched the county championship in the last two years in Kerry hoping that it'll throw up more and more quality defenders because we have a lot of forwards and a lot of really talented forwards but the defenders we have are you know I'm sure you know they're going to have to come up with some kind of a system so that they're not conceding as much as they are and certainly not conceding the type of goals that they are conceding and it's an issue. It's it's so interesting with David Clifford that there's all this expectation ever since you know he was a minor even on a countrywide mm-hmm. scale because it has four goals that day in, yeah. in the minor game, mm-hmm. but like he's a couple of years. This is third season at senior intercounty level. Mm-hmm. He's already like a lot of forwards get criticised over the years because they might not deliver against the biggest teams on the biggest yeah. day. He's a couple of seasons in and he already pretty much delivers every single day against the best teams. Like yeah. that's an incredible thing about. Yeah, him. he is genuinely once in a generation. You know. Um, Morris Fitzgerald and the, the comparisons are obvious and it's yeah. uncanny in ways like some of the similarities Gooch was a once in a gen- now that group that you know we played on had a lot of once in a Declan Sullivan was a once in a lifetime type of footballer you know as a forward you're playing with these lads and saying these guys are good like and uh, you know the rest of us pluggers would fit in somewhere around them you know and you know Stephen O'Brien is playing very well and in any other era he'd probably be the top forward on the Kerry team you know but the Shawnee Shays and then David Clifford just gives you that gasp factor I mean I I was in the Terrace in Killarney for a county championship game last year against Sam Brendan's and he kicked nine points Clifford did and I think it was about five of them from play and it was five times during the course of 60 minutes football you're hearing about 2,000 people collectively gasp and not many players can do that like and that's that's you can and you can be cynical about it and 
put a monetary value on it, say that's a thousand extra bums and seats the next day. And there was a curiosity factor with Clifford because he's going to do something amazing. Every time he goes out, he might be quiet for 10 minutes, but he'll do that. And that's why we love the game. That's why we, we go to see it. We go to see great defenders as well and great backs. And, you know, like some Marco Shea bought defending to another level, Mike McCarthy, Seamus Mine, and these lads. But I always used to argue with the backs, like it's mo- it's harder to be constructive and creative at the other end of the field than it is to do what you, you know, backs have to shut creativity down. That's their job. But with Clifford, you just look, it's art. Like it's, it's, it's beautiful to watch. You know, a, a, a genius working in minimum space, turning, second guessing his opponent, and then just doing what he does. Like it's, it's instinct, and it's, it's whether he's playing with Fossa, which I watched him in a minor final a couple of years ago against the wrong gang of Fossa. It's just a privilege to watch that. You know, it doesn't, ha- it doesn't have to be with sixty thousand people watching, but everything he's done up to now, like he's, he's given us great entertainment. It's it's Kerry against me this weekend, and I couldn't help but think of that that annihilation that you <laughs> suffered. Do you do you remember that? Was that all one two fourteen to five points or yeah, something? Yeah, like yeah, I I remember that. I mean, that was what what the most disappointing aspect of that was that Meat lost the final afterwards to Galway in similar fashion themselves, which maybe you know it was an aberration in a way, like because we weren't that bad. Yeah, uh, we were all Ireland champions at the time, and they absolutely. I mean, you know, you had Giles Garrity and Murphy in their pump. Um, they were a serious team at the time and around that time we would have met them a bit and we would have struggled to beat them you know they beat us in a, a league semi-final in 2000 they beat us in a league quarter-final in 99 they were a good quality team they, they, their trajectory afterwards was just rapid plummeting you know which was a huge surprise but that day yeah it was unforgettable for all the wrong reasons you know we had the wrong jerseys the wrong in hindsight I do think it was a tired Kerry team, and I'm not taking away anything from what me to achieve that day. We had drawn against Dublin, replayed against Dublin. You know, we had to go to the well a lot in, the, in a couple of weeks, and we trained hard between Dublin and Meath, and we were just flat. We were just flat again. Maybe a lack of science, or you know, we we, we just overcooked it, and uh, it's a it's a regret that you you probably would have had like, but. You know, the surprising aspect was watching the final a couple of weeks later and seeing Galway do a similar thing to me. They just did a number of them. And Meat weren't that bad either, you know, even up to half time that day. You know, they're not that bad to get annihilated as they did by Galway. And you have to give Galway serious credit. I, I, I'd be surprised if that happens now, given the, I suppose, the testing and the analytics that go, go into the game now. That you know, back then we would have described it as overcooked, and I'm sure Meat would probably say the same thing. They didn't get the the dynamic right in that final, and between that, work done and freshness. Yeah, yeah, it probably wouldn't happen now that you'd have a top team. You know, there's three or four top teams in the country absolutely annihilating each other. The, the games tend to be a bit closer. You know, yeah. Dublin are probably exceptional in many ways, but even the finals that Dublin win, they tend to win narrowly. Um, but it was happening in, the, in those days like I mentioned the Cork game in 2002 earlier we beat a very good Cork team that day by I don't know we lost count we weren't that much better than them but maybe they were undercooked or overcooked and we were just pitching I think there's more thought and it, the game today is more analytical that's not going to be happening you know that players are pulled out of training which wasn't you couldn't pull out of training in our time you know and I think you know they're, that's just probably one of the benefits of it would you see winning a league as a big deal for Kerry or is it it's all about the summer I think Kerry aren't in a position to be sniffing at anything you know I, I think Kerry should be going out to win every game but I suppose that depends on availability I think the likes of David Moore is critical to Kerry's performance and I think it's very important that they do try out players that they do experiment a certain amount and if that means losing two points in a National League game it's not the end of the world I'm sure they're going out to win every game but um, they are one of the teams maybe that could quite possibly benefit from winning the league. I was hoping that they might do it last year against Mayo and for a long stage of that game. It looked like they might and it would have done them it didn't do them any harm to lose the league final. In fact it exposed a few fissures and cracks that probably needed exposing as well, like and that they they've sorted out during the course of the year. But um, at, the, at the end of the day and at the end of the year championship is where Kerry are going to be judged at, you know, get themselves into that super eight group. Get themselves performing there, and then like, and you know, the, there is a lot of genuine excitement building down in Kerry at the moment because there's a realization from Cork what they've achieved at minor and under under twenties in the last year that they're starting to come, that they're bloody well fed up of being underfoot by Kerry, and 
that they, you know, it's probably patronising and condescending to say it, but Cork are going to bring Kerry on a ton, whether that means by beating them or otherwise. Obviously, they're playing very early in the year this year, so Kerry would rather obviously beat Cork, but if Cork do beat Kerry in late May this year, they're going to expose stuff that Kerry need exposing. Galway did a bit of it in the league, Toronto did it recently as well. Like, you know, they're learning a lot. You know, they need to be in Division 1. Any team that's serious about themselves need to be in Division 1. So that's the main aspiration, I think, you know. And would you have come up against Desi Farrell much either than on or off the field over the years? Uh, we would have played in that 0-1 quarterfinals below on Thurless. Um, Dublin weren't a factor over the most of my playing career. The early years, it was the Northern teams, the, the Derrys, the Downs, the Tyrones. In the middle part, it was Meath, Galway, Kerry in those years. And towards the end, it was back to the Northern teams. Dublin weren't a big factor. Desi was, I remember Desi as a minor in 1988. Um, I wouldn't have come across I was never a, a card and I was never a member of the GPA <laughs> arguments with Desi over that over the years man I have huge respect for like you know and he's, he's a good GA man you know and a good club man as well which is important um, but uh, I wouldn't know him that well you know there's a few uh, Kerry men managing elsewhere I'll probably yeah. finish up with this so you've Mike Quirk with Leash yeah. um, Jack okay. O'Connor and Paul Gavin yeah. what do you make of them going going uh, further afield yeah it, it's a decision to me, I'm traditional GA. I don't want anybody leaving the borders of Kerry. I want all the knowledge of Kerry football and of Gaelic football contained within Kerry to the betterment of Kerry football. I don't believe anybody should leave their own club to go to... I'm very traditional in that regard. But Paul is based in Dublin. Mike is a tree man who has a good road to leash. And Jack O'Connor has a chief eat because he has a lot to contribute to whatever team he's going to go. And um, he, he, Jack certainly, in terms of contributing to Kerry football, doesn't oh Kerry football and he's done the minors he's done the under 21s he's done the seniors he's achieved an awful lot and it's probably a curiosity to see how would he get on Mick O'Dwyer would have started that years ago and achieved an awful lot outside it I never liked seeing Kerry people leave Kerry and that's I won't say a supremacist or anything like that but I just don't like uh, I wouldn't like to see a Gaelic man going to another club um, and it certainly was it was it was a it was a concern of parties when he went outside to do Westmead that he would have to plan to beat Kerry uh, at a particular stage because Pawdy was dyed in the wool Kerry I mean I remember seeing that documentary with Westmead afterwards yeah, and people being in awe of you know the pre-match speeches and, so, and we were saying Jesus imagine what you if you got if you would have left the cameras in with Kerry what you know because a lot of what Pawdy was about was a love of Kerry and being tied into that you know and how did that transmit to Westmead dressing room he got he gave them a good shot of it now in fairness and gave them a, but you know I think there was a lot of talent in Westmead as well at the time and uh, but Paul is the most interesting one, I think, you know, because he's a, he, he's a player in the early part of his career that would have had a, a lot of hurt from being ignored. And then when he got his chance, turned out to be this fantastic footballer and was a brilliant player for Kerry for a long, long time. And he thinks a lot about the game. I would, I'd love to be in the dressing room to see what he's like in the dressing room because... He wouldn't have been one of the lads, t- you know, 10, 15 years ago, he said, would have gone on to inter-county management. But now that he is, I think he's going to be very, very good because he applies himself so well to everything. And I was talking to somebody that's uh, peripherally involved and they would know his stuff. Um, John would have been in Kerry dressing rooms and he said, look, this guy is really good. You know, and I, 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 I hope to see the results of that in Wexford's performances and results this year. I think he's going to be a really interesting manager and I think he's going to be... You know, he'd put a lot of time, thought and effort into it and creativity and so he'd be one to watch, I think. So there's no chance of you going managing outside Kerry? It wouldn't be up to it. I wouldn't, you know, to be, I, I, there's no chance of me involved in inter-county. I've nothing but, remember when Eamon Fitzmaurice got the job saying, are hey, you mad? Like, you know, and he did an unbelievable job with that Kerry team at the time in 13 and 14 in particular, you know, because nobody wanted the job back then. I remember saying, how are they going to get the time? How are you going to... I, I just don't, like, that competitiveness has gone out of me you know I'm, when the game is on and you can't play the game anymore and to me okay, you can, I remember Paddy answering a question years ago when you were 44 years of age and two stone overweight as I am now in the same age and the same weight probably it's the next best thing is managing a team to try and win an All-Ireland I don't have that itch in me I don't have that curiosity or that urge I would rather contribute you know more to the club and it's probably a cop out in a way 
it's probably an e- certainly an easier thing to do. Yeah. Even though Fitzmaurice would have told me in those years that he was a Kerry, a lot of the time he said, with Kerry you're getting 30 motivated guys who are not going to give you excuses for not showing up at training. They all want to be there. It's about giving a structure around that, whereas at club level you are dealing with a lot of disparate voices and desperate voices in other cases. Um, but it's not something, and I think there's a window there. If I was going to be doing it, I'd have done it by now. And if I was going to be asked, I'd have been asked by now. I just don't see, that's not where it's at for me at the moment. Like, uh, to me, the big question at the moment is, you know, survival, go out the club. Lisbon, Dingle, now in Skull have amalgamated a minor under 16 uh, this week in Kerry. South Kerry is decimated by a rural depopulation. That to me is the burning issue for Kerry GA people at the moment, and that needs to be radically addressed. Like, you've been very good at your time. Thanks very much, Sarah. No problem at all. No problem. Thanks for watching our game. Don't forget to like and share the videos, and if you're new to the channel, hit subscribe.